Hi everyone, this is Ksenia Brunovska, your local guide into nuclear world, and this is the pep talk. And yes, it returns, hopefully. <laughs> um, I know that I have some explanation to do. Well, this past year has been really difficult because I was doing a, my second and last, hopefully last year, my master's degree at Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology uh, here in Daejeon, South, South Korea. I'm feeling right now here. And it was really hard to do full-time masters and a couple of part-time jobs and YouTube channel. But in June, hopefully, hopefully, I graduate and I'll have much more free time. But before that moment, I really wanted to upload two episodes that I actually filmed last year in summer and haven't yet got a chance to publish them. So I really want to publish those two episodes to kind of start off the second season of the Nuclear Pep Talk with the topic, with the overarching topic that is very dear to my heart. And it's also my master thesis topic and this is nuclear legacy and nuclear justice. I'm writing about nuclear justice mechanisms, but here on YouTube, we're gonna talk to representatives of the communities that have been affected by nuclear testing in Kazakhstan and on the Marshall Islands. In this episode that you're watching now, we're gonna talk to Dmitry Veselov, a cab driver from Kazakhstan, and he's also a victim or a survivor of nuclear testing at the Semiplatis nuclear test site. Hearing and listening to the voices of survivors who have been affected somehow by nuclear weapons use, and specifically in this case by nuclear testing, is crucial for nuclear justice. And that's why I really want to use my YouTube channel to give those voices a space, a space to be heard. So I hope you enjoy this episode. So thank you, Dmitry, for being with a nuclear pep talk today and share your story on my YouTube channel. Thank you for that honor. And without further ado, please introduce yourself. My name is Dmitry Veselov. I was born in 1976 in Semipalatinsk, Kazakh SSR. I work as a cab driver in the status of individual entrepreneur. I am a third-generation victim of nuclear testing at the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. What happened in Semipalatinsk? The city of Semipalatinsk, now Semei, is located in the eastern part of the Republic of Kazakhstan. During the Soviet Union times, from 1949 to 1989, nuclear tests were carried out near the city. Over 616 nuclear and thermonuclear devices, including atmospheric tests. In a straight line from the city to the test site, it is less than 100 kilometers to the west and south. West. According to accounts of old timers, a number of explosions were visible from the city. The city, due to topography and other factors, is on the leeward side of the polygon. Dmitry, how nuclear testing affected you? I have been diagnosed with a genetic disease at the Research Institute of Pediatrics and Pediatric Surgery. It's called crania clavicular dysostosis, short Howard marie Santon syndrome. It's characterized by certain anatomical skeletal changes. None of their relatives have this disease. Dimitri, who is compensating that damage? According to the legislation of the Republic of Kazakhstan, it's the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection that deals with compensation for victims of nuclear tests. I am not aware of any other countries or bodies. What are the existing types of compensation? There are several types of compensation. The most common type of compensation is the one-time payment to persons who lived at the time of the polygon operation in certain areas of the Semipalatinsk, Pavlodar and Karagandar regions. The test site is at the junction of these regions. It depends on the time of residence in the areas listed by law and the proximity of the area to the test site. The second type is the special state allowance. It's approximately 30 to 35,000 tenge per month. 
in order to receive it, a conclusion of a special body about a direct connection between ionizing radiation and the disease is required. The third type is disability pension due to illness caused by ionizing radiation. The amount of payment under this type depends on the degree of disability. Why did you decide to share your story? The main reason is the awareness of the fact that a lot of people have no idea about the dangers of nuclear weapons. And what kind of compensation did you receive? I did not receive compensation. In my case, the lump sum compensation, according to the law, is about 20,000 tenge, which is less than 50 US dollars at the exchange rate. To receive it, you need to provide documents confirming the residence in listed areas. In addition, it's necessary to provide the so-called polygon certificate. Here it is. Here is the cover, and this is the certificate itself. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, this is a ridiculous amount, which does not cover my monthly need. Likewise, an additional leave of absence should be paid for at the employer expense. Thus, a substantial percentage of individuals are deprived of either equal employment rights due to additional financial burden on the employer or the benefit itself. In my example, this is a particular evident. I am self-employed, so I have to give leave days to myself and pay tax for not working at the same time. Uh, Winter, I also, I also know that for the victims or survivors of nuclear testing, it is very important to prove their status. So can you tell us what kind of statuses exist and what's the difference between them? In accordance with the legislation, to receive a state allowance, persons should be recognized by a specialized body, the Interdepartmental Expert Council, as victims of ionizing radiation. They should have this document proving that they actually mm -hmm. suffered from ionizing radiation. In the event of their death, from such a disease. One of their close relatives have the right to receive a special state allowance. To get it, it's necessary to provide a medical history, documents confirming their diagnosis, the results of examinations and the opinion of representative of the professorship, and also to pay the fee. Disability pensions are awarded on the basis of the decision of the Medical and Social Expert Commission, with a determination of the degree of loss of ability to work. The amount of payment is directly linked to the presence of the aforementioned document and the degree of loss of ability to work. However, it should be noted that the assignment of special state benefit is made upon establishment of disability. In the absence of disability, no payments or benefits are made to victims of disability. In my case, despite the conclusion of specialized professors and the presence of conclusion from a specialized body on the nature of the disease, I was denied disability. Thus. Using my example, it's possible to see that this law works in very pecu peculiar way. That is, if I die from exceeding the permissible workload, and this is what is reflected in the conclusion, then one of my relatives will receive payment from the state. But while I'm alive, I'm actually not entitled to anything. In the best traditions of any state, the government is trying in every way to reduce the number of recipients of disability pensions and special state benefits. They often require the impossible. For example, I know of the case that the results of biopsy were demanded from the relatives of a person who died of cancer 
but the Bureau of Forensic Medicine refused to issue the results. In appeal to the supervisory and judicial authorities also yield no results. Often there is also an incomplete depiction of the causes of death. How does your condition influence your daily life? This disease directly affects my life. In particular, I am not allowed to lift heavy weights. Three to four kilograms is the maximum and often prohibitive load on my arms. Because of my lack of clavicles and rigid connection of arms with the rest of skeleton, muscles and ligaments are stretched. There have also been cases of torn tendons. At such moments, even elementary things, such as stirring sugar with a spoon, becomes an impossible task, because the injured hand becomes like a whip. Due to vertebral body impaction, the time spent in an upright position, including sitting, is also limited. Four to six hours is the maximum time for me. Because of the disease, my teeth are very bad. I am 45 years old. However, I am not getting dangerous due to the fact that I have the beginnings of teeth and they can start growing at any time. Unfortunately, they are growing already damaged. Moreover, I am single. I have no children. My disease is on the genetic level, which will be passed on to my children. It's very scary than you realize. There is nothing you can do. Being a responsible person, I don't want my children to suffer from this disease. None of the doctors could give a definitive answer about the health of my offspring. So, it's my responsible choice and at the same time my greatest pain to consciously give up the joy of fatherhood, of not being able to pick up my ch child. There is hope that medicine will make a serious step forward and give me an opportunity to have healthy children, but even so, I am afraid the cost of this procedure will be very high. Thank you, Dmitry, for sharing. And uh, could, you, um, could you tell the audience what are the ways to help the current survivor, the, the living survivors of nuclear testing in Semipolatinsk. There is a need for a state program that really works, aimed at the deepening the social integration of victims, which would include not only medical, but also psychological assistance, so that people do not feel abandoned along with the problems business support through tax deduction and or subsidies, which would create jobs for the victims according to their abilities, would also be a necessary factor. Of course, even a certain amount of employment will not give a decent standard of living. It's necessary to raise the amount of payments to the level of average monthly income in the region of residence. It's also necessary to assess the sources of both drinking and technical water in the areas adjacent to the test site. In addition to above, it's necessary to assess the quality of mined fuel. Coal is mined in the adjacent area. And what would you like to change in a system of the victim assistance and survivors assistance in, uh, in, in Semipolitinsk? First of all, in my opinion, there is a need for openness, the complete and accurate display of information about victims. This requires standardization in the approach to the recognition of victims. Often people who are victims do not know about the benefit they are entitled to. Also, in my opinion, it's necessary to remove disability from the requirements for payment of special state benefits. To equalize the benefits of the polygons victims with victims of the Chernobyl accident. In addition, there should be a quota for victims in the representative bodies of power. 
I would like to make special mention of the danger of nuclear weapons. They are not selective. If they are used, everyone will suffer, regardless of faith, age, color, wealth or social status. There are no small or clean bombs. The various claims to use a small bomb are in fact only an attempt to legalize its use. Any use of nuclear weapons will lead to social catastrophe. In the worst case scenario, we will return to a society in which animal instincts reign supreme. Therefore, our answer is a total ban of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Dmitry, for sharing your story today with our audience. I'm sure that after our conversation, more people have learned about the atrocities that the use of nuclear weapons can cause, even in a testing form. So thank you very much for sharing your story. And for those who have been watching, remember, fear is here. Learn about nuclear. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next episode that will come really, really soon. Bye.